Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer and this is Superhouse. In the last episode I showed you how to build a really simple air quality sensor using nothing but a Wemos D1 Mini and a Plantower PMS5003 particulate matter sensor. It's basically the simplest thing you could build. Three solder connections, two parts and TAS motor. But it has a couple of big limitations and we're going to fix that this time. What we're going to do is take that existing project and extend it. So if you're watching this and you haven't seen the previous episode, you really need to go back and watch that first. I'm going to assume that you've already gone through that and you've got all of that background and got to the point of at least understanding how this one was built. Because what we're going to do is take this project, add a display, add a mode button, load some custom software onto it and give it some extra features. For the display version of the air quality sensor, we're going to need to start with the same parts as last time. We need the Plantower PMS5003 particulate matter sensor and the cable that it came with. And we also need a Wemos D1 Mini. But we also need a couple of new parts. We need a 128 by 32 pixel OLED display, 0.91 inch size. These things are only a couple of bucks and they've got I2C interface. They're really easy to talk to and they're awesome. I buy them about 20 at a time because I put them into all sorts of projects. They're great for doing things like displaying the IP address that a device has been assigned. And we also need a tact switch. Now, these tact switches are really common, but the size that you would normally see is usually six by six millimeter base and about five millimeters high from the bottom of the base to the top of the stalk. What I'm using in this is a longer one. This is a nine millimeter long tact switch. So it's nine millimeters from the base to the top of the stalk. That's just to make it fit into the case the way I've designed it. Now you might choose to use a totally different button or you, know, you want to use a different enclosure. But what I've done is designed this 3D printed case, which has a little area up the top here where the button goes in. And if you look at the render, you can see that there isn't room for the pins. That's where it needs to go in. So what I'm going to do is on this button, I'm going to cut off the leads on one side of the button. And on the other side, I'm going to cut them so that they just protrude a millimeter or two. So it ends up with slightly longer leads on one side than the other. And then it can slide into this little cavity right here. It's a, um, it's a fairly firm fit. It's quite well tuned in terms of the dimensions. And then it will protrude through the top of the case and you can push it. So if we had everything else in place, the two halves of the case would close over it. And then the button is visible through the top part of the case, just like that. So this is a, um, a fairly tight little project here, getting all the wires into place. It's quite a tight fit. Now if I do the same with the display, I'll squeeze that in. You can see the pins are visible down there. I'll put the button back in and everything sort of interlocks so that it sits in the top of the case there. Visible display, accessible button. So. Now we've got to wire them all together. Now the first connections to make are the ones to the PMS5003. So if you got as far as building the basic version of this uh, air quality sensor, you should already have something like this. It's the PMS5003, a D1 Mini, and we've got these connections. Until now, the only connections we've needed are five volts and ground to power the sensor and the TX line from the sensor going to D4 on the D1 Mini. But to do some more advanced things, like put the PMS to sleep in between readings and make sure the sensor will last as long as possible, we also need to add a connection from D6 on the D1 Mini to the RX pin on the PMS. That way we can send it commands like go to sleep or wake up. Next we have the connections for the OLED. That runs on 3.3 volts, so just connect up ground and VCC to 3.3 volts. And then we need to connect I squared C, so SCL and SDA. For the mode button, what we'll do is connect it to D3 and ground. Then in software, we can turn on the input pull up on D3. And whenever the button is pressed, it'll pull that input low down to ground. And that way we can detect button presses. I'm not gonna bore you with 15 minutes of me just soldering together some connections. So I'll just give you some hints on how to get all of this to fit neatly. The first trick is that with the button uh, with the leads cut off one side and shortened on the other, is just to get a pair of pliers or something and put a bit of a bend on those leads so that they come out at maybe a 45 degree angle. 
something like that. And then what we can do is solder the jumper wires onto that coming out so that they come out almost uh, at right angles to the switch position. So if I just solder these ones on here, you will see that they come out from the switch pretty much horizontal and the leads come down with a little dog leg on them. And that way, when we want to fit it into the case, the switch goes into the cavity and then the leads go into the little slot. You can see the slot that I designed along this edge here, that's where these leads need to go. And then just stuff them down so they're out of the way, bend them around, and then you're ready to move on to the display. Now this is one that I just pulled out of the case, so it's already got all the wires in place. And the next trick is to push the display in from the end with this little cable on it, the, um, the ribbon cable that wraps around, the flex cable. It's a very tight fit end to end in here and if you just push the display straight in you may end up catching on the end of this cable. Depending on how well this display has been made these cables may stick out a little bit. So the trick I found is that you insert this end first about halfway and then you push it gently to compress the cable and then it slides in at the other end. So a little bit of jiggling and you can get that to go in. So what I did to assemble this was I put the button in place with the lead, I soldered some wires onto the display just coming out and I put that into the case so I had all of the loose wires hanging out and then I cut them to length and soldered them onto the D1 Mini and this is the end result. So from the switch I've got one lead which comes to ground up on here and the other lead that goes down to the digital input so that we can read button events. Now what I found is that uh, because I already had a wire coming into ground down here, I didn't have anywhere easily to connect ground, so I just hold it onto the back of this USB socket. Now that's pretty dodgy, it's not a great idea, and if you look at the socket you can see that there are some little holes in it, and if you go too far with this and you put a bit too much solder on, you can end up with some wicking down inside the socket, and that'll block it from being used. But if you're careful, just put a dab of solder on the top of the socket. You can use that as a convenient ground location. Solder a ground wire onto that. So once all of this is done, I'll get this one out of the way. We can insert the switch, insert the OLED, stuff all the wires down, get the D1 Mini in place, and then we can close it up just like we did with the first one. And uh, actually, since I printed this case, I've tweaked the design a little to improve clearance around the OLED. So this one's a little bit tight. If you download the version of the case that I'll publish with this episode, it's got more clearance around the pins than this one has. And then we can slide this over the top. Once again, a little bit of jiggling. There are lots of things in there to get in the way. Oh, and this is something I found too. If you find that you get it to a situation where the case can't quite close, you can see that what's holding it up is around this corner in this case. There's probably a wire that has slipped out of position. So you might find that it's useful to grab yourself a pair of tweezers. Oh look, you can see here what's happened. The wire from the switch has come up out of the slot and it's blocking here against the case. So what we can do is move these wires across, push them down into the slot. In fact, if you're um, if it's being really annoying, you might find that it's worth putting a drop of super glue or something on there just to hold the wire in place. So now if we repeat that process, hopefully we will be able to get that uh, piece to sit in. There we go. It's all sitting closed. So now we've got everything in the enclosure. We can plug USB in here. And now it's time to get some software onto this. Now you can run Tasmoda on this, same as we did in the first episode, and it will work just fine with the limitation that you won't have the display and the button won't do anything. So what we're going to do this time is look at some software that I've hacked together to make this uh, take advantage of the display 
and the Mode button. Now the code I've written for this is inspired by the Wemos Dust Sensor project by SwapBap on GitHub, but Lena's project is oriented more around Amazon Web Services. It's got an AWS client in it, and I wanted something that was more like a generic MQTT project. And so I started off by beginning with Lena's project and then modified it rather dramatically. But if you want to see where it came from, have a look at the Wemos Dust Sensor project by SwapBap on GitHub. I'll put the link for that on the project page for this episode. Now to compile the code for this project, you need to get the Arduino IDE set up for ESP8266 development. I'm not going to go through that in detail here, but on the project page I will put instructions on it. It's basically copying a URL, pasting it into a place in the preferences, and then installing the board profile. What that allows you to do is select Wemos D1 Mini as the target device, and then it will be able to compile the code correctly. You also need to install a couple of libraries. For this particular project, we have three external libraries. There's the Adafruit GFX library, the Adafruit SSD 1306, and PubSub client. Once again, I'll put instructions for how to do that on the project page. To configure the sketch, go into the config.h file. Have a look up the top. There are probably only three things you need to change. Put your SSID in here, put your Wi-Fi password in here, and change this to match the IP address of your MQTT broker. There are also some other options like how the reporting is done and the reporting period for the sensor, but you don't need to change any of those. In the follow-up video for this, I'm going to go into great detail in how the source code for this project works, and I'm going to explain all of these options so that you can configure it to work the way you want it to. For now, you can just leave those as they are. Just change the Wi-Fi details and the MQTT broker. So with those values set, just select the target device as you would for any regular Arduino project and upload it. Once you've uploaded the sketch, the air quality sensor will reboot and you'll start getting some information coming up on the display. You'll also be able to toggle through different screens. I'm going to hook this one up to a bench power supply now so that we can see what happens when it starts up and also see what happens with the power consumption and the sleep modes of the sensor. Now I've connected this up to a USB cable that I've hacked and plugged into my RD Tech uh, lab power supply and I've got the interface for it up here on my phone. I've got a Wi-Fi connection to the power supply. So what I can do is turn on the supply. It'll supply 5 volts. You can see that the, um, the AQS has started up. It started off with a little splash screen that just gave a URL and says what it is. And then the default screen that it comes up with is particles in micrograms per cubic meter. And it just says preparing sensor and waiting for data. Now you can see over here on the current consumption it's currently sitting up around 120 milliamps, around about, um, so it's on a 5 volt power supply. And the, um, the current consumption is jumping around a little bit. Right now it will be in a state where, oh look, we've got some readings on here. They're all zero so far because it hasn't really got proper readings yet. And you can also see that the current has dropped right down. So what's happened is that the first 30 seconds expired and it then put the sensor to sleep which has then decreased the current consumption. And after about a minute and a half, the power will go back up. But what we can do now is use this button to toggle through different screens. You can see here we've got the micrograms per cubic meter screen. And if I click through to the next screen, which is particles per deciliter, it still says preparing sensor and waiting for data. The reason for that is the first time we take a reading from the sensor, I always get bogus values for PPD. So I ignore it on the first cycle through and then click through to the next screen, and it gives us an info screen. We can see the IP address of the device. We can see ESP8266-3CF032. Uh, so 3CF032 is the unique ID for this device. We can see it's connected to the SSID of Superhouse. Wi-Fi is OK. If it wasn't, it would say failure or something in there. I can't remember. We'll see that in the code. And uptime, so 109, 110 seconds, currently counting up. So once this gets up to 120 seconds, which is two minutes, we should see the power go back up, and that means that it will have started back up the sensor for its 30 second warm up period. There it goes. You can see the um, little spike on the graph there. And then 30 seconds of operation. And I'm gonna leave it on this screen while we let this 30 seconds expire, because it should replace this holding text with readings for the PPD values once it gets them back from that PMS5003. 
it's uh, running the fan, it's about to take a reading, and the current consumption should drop off right after this once it's taken that reading, and it puts the sensor back to sleep again. There we go. So now we've got a reading. So we've got PPD values that have just replaced that holding screen. We can see 462 uh, particles per deciliter in the 0 0.3 range. So what this means is that we've got a device that is reporting over the network to MQTT, just like using the Tasmoda version, but we can also just walk up to it, look at the screen and take readings off it, and then flip through to see different values. And um, also the status of the device, so the IP address. If you power this up and you don't know what address it's been assigned, what its um, unique ID is, you can just look at the screen and it's right there. So it's really convenient compared to the version that doesn't have the display on it. On the project page for this episode, I published the design files for both the basic version and the display version of the case. So if you've got your own 3D printer, you can just print it and make this project yourself. But if you want these cases, I can print them out as well. I've got them in a whole bunch of colours. I've got black, white, translucent, blue, red, yellow, green. And what I'm going to do is, uh, for anyone that buys one of the cases for the display version, I'll include the 9mm long tack switch. Because it's a slightly unusual size, I've got a whole bunch of them. So I'll put one of those in with the case. So, if you want to come up with your own design, I would really love to see it as well. The follow-up video for this is going to be an in-depth look at the source code for the sketch that I did for this project. I'm going to explain exactly how it works, how it does the timing for keeping the sensor asleep and then waking it up when required, and how you can configure the reporting so that you get the information that you want. So if you want to know more about how this works, stick around and check out the next episode. In the meantime, go and build something cool.